I've entitled the message this morning, I Am Second. I didn't, I really wasn't terribly up to speed with I Am Second until a few years ago when I was at a Royals game, which a lot of good things happen at Royals games, I found. And sitting next to me, in fact, it was during the World Series game, sitting next to me at game six in 2014 uh, was uh, two young men, and they each had uh, shirts that were, that were kind of cut off at the elbow, almost like a jersey of some sort, but on their wrists they had a, a little band that said, I am second. Now my thought was, oh, these, they must be professing something. So and I just decided I'd ask them, the I am second, you mean that Jesus is first? And they said, absolutely. And then they began to tell me a little bit about their uh, passion to witness for Jesus Christ and their identifying uh, I am second. Kind of like 20 some years ago when we wore our, our wristbands that said WWJD. You know, what would Jesus do? And just a, an inanimate counselor to remind us that there are wonderful ways to confess to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. We see the crosses on people's necks, the inanimate counselors that tell people that I belong to Jesus, I love the Lord. Now, hopefully it's not just jewelry, <laughs> but uh, this identifying mark of Christ in our life. And so the message this morning is, I am second, found from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through about the first half of verse 3. A shorter passage of scripture. Don't let that bother you, because there'll be two other scriptures that are long. But this one, found from 1 Peter chapter 4, it says 1 through 11, but we're just going to go... One through three, the first half of it. So listen to the word of the Lord. Peter writes, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. So we have this idea before us that the apostle believed that uh, somehow this, this uh, life in Christ could be uh, something that we would put in the done category. I'm not, and I, we're going to talk quite a bit about this done with sin stuff, but, but this, this idea that my, my life in Christ could bring me to a point where I want to be so done with sin. I mean, it's, it's an attitude that, that Peter talks about. Arm yourself with the attitude of Christ that I am done with sin. The apostle, Peter, believed that they would see Jesus return in their generation. They didn't think that they were going to be stuck in an environment of sinfulness for very long. They just anticipated the return of Jesus Christ. And so uh, uh, they, they had this urgency in the way that they lived. Time to them is so limited, so they needed to be intentional in their service of Jesus. However, here we are 2,000 years later, and we tend to live, if you'll accept this or not, we tend to live as if uh, he's never going to return. We live in a, in a way sometimes that is indicative of, well, I'll always have another opportunity to deal with this issue that I'm dealing with, this obedience thing. And so we... We sometimes we put off stuff that the Holy Spirit is ri r rising up in us to deal with. And this attitude, oh God, I want to be done with that. What's, what's that going to look like when this is no longer uh, causing me what it's causing me? The thought that I will have ample time later to make that commitment and correct the issue, it kind of lulls us into a spiritual inactivity. It's kind of the, I, now this is crazy, and this is why, why sometimes you just kind of look at me with a grain of salt, but it's kind of the wimpy syndrome. How many of you remember the cartoon Popeye and his friend Wimpy? 
Wimpy always wanted a hamburger, remember? But he never wanted to pay for it until Tuesday. I would love a hamburger today, he would say to Popeye. Loan me some money today and I'll make it right on Tuesday. Of course, every Popeye issue I ever saw, our, our, our episode, it, Tuesday never came. So I call it the wimpy syndrome. <laughs> Not wimpy as in I'm a wimp, but wimpy in that uh, I just don't want to make right something that God is dealing with me now about. I would just say to you, deal with what the Lord deals with you now. Don't assume that there'll always be another day to deal with that. If we would have continued on in this passage, this reading of verses 3 through 11, we would have heard Peter say that he's convinced, verse 7, that the end of all things is near. Therefore, live accordingly. Be alert and clear-minded so you can pray. He would say, love one another because love covers a multitude of your shortcomings. He would say later on, be hospitable to one another without complaining that you have to be hospitable or put out somehow by what you're having to do. He said later on, use your spiritual gifts as God intends you to do. That's why God gave them to you in the first place, to use what he has given. Peter, in this passage, is imploring us to live out our lives in urgency. But we will not live this way unless we determine to make God first place in our lives, which, by the way, is what I mean by I am second. He is first, and you are a close third. If you listen to Jesus telling us about the commandments of God that are most significant, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. One, two, three. So one more time, let's think about this text. First of all, the word that jumps out of the very first word of chapter 4 is therefore. And that's parenthetical. In other words, it ties to another portion of scripture which leads us all the way back to three, verse, chapter 3, verse 18. Therefore takes us back to that identifying mark that we looked at last week which takes us back to the identifying mark that Tom preached about two weeks ago. Because that passage of Scripture last week started with finally. Therefore, finally, always takes you back to something previous. The reality is, it goes all the way back to the second chapter of this first letter of Peter's. Tying everything together. The good news is we didn't try to conquer it all in one message. We would have started four weeks ago, and we would still be in service today. But we look at how they continue to go with one another. Therefore, is parenthetical, tying the portion back to the description of Jesus' suffering. Since Jesus suffered in his body, arm yourself with the same attitude. Arm yourself is a military description. It's an action which means to equip yourself with a weapon to be prepared for battle arm yourself be ready for something what are you supposed to arm yourself with not with your baseball bat if anyone were to break into my house they don't have to worry about a firearm but I keep a very good baseball bat under my bed and I'm telling you I'm a switch hitter I can smack you from either side And I better make that first whack a good one. <laughs> Arm yourself. What, with what? Arm yourself with the attitude of Jesus Christ. The attitude we are to arm ourselves with is the attitude Jesus demonstrated in living his life. He suffered. Which we determined previously, last week, to be obedience to God's will even to the point of death I don't really want to experience death Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane take this cup away from me we're going to be sharing in the Eucharist at the end of the service this morning take this cup away from me if it be your will 
But if not, I'm willing to die. Suffer. With the mindset of Christ. That's what Jesus modeled for us. And this is what Peter is asking us to do. But to me, the difficulty with this verse in Peter's statement comes at the end of the second verse. Or, I'm sorry, the end of the first verse. It says, arm yourself with the same attitude of Christ because whoever suffers in this body is done with sin. Could we talk about that for just a moment this morning? Be, being done with something as huge and prevalent in our world as sin is creates a legitimate question, I think, in the Christian's life. What does it mean to be done with sin? That's the question that comes to my mind. What does this mean? It should help us to hear, I think, what our article of faith says in the Church of the Nazarene Manual as it defines sin for us. Maybe we need to understand what sin is a little bit in order to have some clue as to what Peter is saying about being done with this sin. The Church of the Nazarene says, we believe, first of all, it says that sin is both original and and personal. In other words, it's an inherent nature and it is also an action. Sin is both original and personal. The Church of the Nazarene says, quote, we believe that sin came into the world through the disobedience of our first parents and death followed. We believe that sin is of two kinds, original sin or depravity and actual sin or personal sin. We believe that original sin or depravity is that corruption of the nature of all the offspring of Adam by reason of which everyone is very far gone from the original righteousness and pure state that God created us with. We've been tainted. Because Adam and Eve made a willful decision to disobey God, an inherent thing was attached to humanity that has carried on from that time forward. It is called carnal sin, carnal nature, original sin. Not deep dish crust, but original sin. Sorry. It's just where I go. Original sin. Because I am a part of the human race, I concur with Paul's statement when he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned not because of something necessarily that they do or have done. They sin because they are by nature inherently evil. Wow. We sometimes think, about our little ones that we dedicate or we baptize, those little babies that are so innocent and so pure and they just, they just do things to us that make us so blessed to be able to be a, a parent of this little one and to see their, their innocence and, and then come to the realization that they, in, they too are tainted by this inherent nature. And at some point... They will look at you with those big eyes. And when you tell them no, they will look at you and go, yes. Now, they may not know the consequence of their disobedience at that point because we believe that there is a time in the child's life when they will know the consequence of their disobedience. And until that time, they're not responsible for that big brown-eyed no, yes or no or whatever. But indeed, there will come a time when they will recognize that the reason I am leaning toward a sinful expression is because I am, by nature, a sinner. Long before the things I do, I have some need of God's work in my life just because of my nature. This is an old-time message, okay? 
just want to get you ready for this. This is an old-time message. <laughs> Talking about original sin and carnal nature and inherited sinfulness. It's an important message. The reason that we do sins of action is because we are bent toward doing that. We're not bent toward righteousness. We've been changed. And there needs to be the work of God in our lives that makes us sick of those things that we say, I am done with this. Now that doesn't make it done just because I come to that point of conclusion, but it it is the beginning of the ability of God to work in my life so that my attitude of being sick of this matches with my surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ to do something in me that changes me again to how Christ wants me to be. Let me explain this if I can. I'll give you an example in my life of being done with something and yet not being done. <laughs> and by the way, can I just tell you, I'm 61 and I'm still not done. That's another sermon, another subject, but I want to talk about this idea of being attitudinally sick of sin. When I was 23 years old, I gave my life to Jesus. Wendy and I got saved at the same time in the same revival service, and we, we were convicted uh, to confess our sins, and, and, and I had a book. Wendy's book was much thinner. My, my book had a, I had cataloged sin. I'm just saying, I, I don't, I couldn't even remember them all, which is a good thing you don't have to. But I remember being convicted to give my life, my heart to Jesus, and to confess my sins. So at age 23, Wendy and I went to the altar and we gave our life to Jesus Christ. Now one of the things immediately that I knew I was done with, absolutely done with, God made it so clear to me that I could not continue as a child of God's to be smoking dope and drinking alcohol. Now can any of you just recognize how maybe that might not be good? Are you, in, is, or maybe we're all, you know what, we, if we were Native American today, we'd be passing out peyote. It would, well, we probably wouldn't, but I don't know what to tell you, folks. I just knew right off the bat that I had to be done with this part of my life. It was so obvious, even, even obvious to the point of recognizing that to to continue on in that would mean absolutely nothing, this confession I made to Jesus Christ. Nothing. Now, I didn't have the full picture at this point what it would mean to be done with sin, but I did indeed know that that part of my life had to be over. I had this new attitude within me that came as a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ that this behavior would not fly with him. And then he began to take me through a whole series of things. Did, did any of you ever used to struggle? No hands, but did any of you used to ever struggle with uh, profanity? Just words that came out attached to your emotions. And you go, oh man, I can't believe I just said that. And neither could your Sunday school class. <laughs> like, did you really just say that? And you call yourself a Christian. And I go, yes, I do. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised by it too, but you know what, Sister Jones, you made me mad. And what came with my mad was words I used to say, not even thinking about that language, that profanity. And so I used to pray, oh God, I'm struggling so with this language that I have. I don't want to use this language, but apparently this is what's tied to my emotions and I need you to do something in my emotions. I need you to take this to the, the root of my problem, which is not so much the language I use, but it's the anger I have.
What can you do with that? And God began to deal in these areas in my life with profanity and with, and with anger. And, and then I, you know, I was not the sharpest uh, uh, knife in the drawer or the brightest bulb in the school. And I was in mid-America and I found myself being tempted to take my glasses with me on test day. I'm just telling you, what was that about? Well, you know, it was my, my eyesight was blurry enough that I really couldn't see what the person next to me was writing down. And I, how, I was a religion major, and I wanted to get a good grade. And so I put my glasses on, and the Lord says, what are you doing? That's why I'm trying to see what my neighbor wrote down. I studied it, and I know I know it. I just can't recall it right now. And I put my glasses on, and the Lord convicted me right there. You know, I see, what, here's what happened in this done with evil stuff. I really wasn't done with the battle. The temptation was just as prevalent as ever before. The problem I was having was, where is this thing inside of me that makes me so badly want to get an A in this class that I would put my glasses on? to make sure I didn't miss one or two questions. Something's wrong in here. And so I took my glasses off, and then my eyes began to water because God was getting the message through to me that this was a battle I was having, and it was something new I needed to surrender. And on and on and on and on again, through my life, I find victory from Jesus Christ when I come to this attitude that I am so done with this, Lord. I can't believe this is still a battle in my life. Here's here's the reality. If I could get just as practical as I know how to be this morning, here's the reality. We are still surrounded by an environment to sin. It never goes away. And Satan's desire, just like it was with Adam and Eve, is the same same exact desire for you and me, and that is that we might disobey God. Put him on this side burner and do what we want to do. And that never goes away, ever. It just changes forms. I mean, I was so done with pot. I knew that wasn't going to be done. I'm still done 40 years later. (laughs) That doesn't work. So done with things that no longer work. Here's the reality. Satan, when he comes to us, he comes to us in areas of former success. This is what used to work. So he comes in the form of a temptation. Disobey God in this area because it used to work. This used to be problematic. Here's the reality. Satan comes where he used to succeed, but he does not know the rock-solid commitment that you and I have made to Jesus Christ that this will not work. I am done with this. He is not all-knowing. Jesus is all-knowing. He just knows this has worked in the past. Therefore, he comes at us where he has succeeded in the past. But not only does he not know what Jesus has done in your life, he also will never stop coming at you in new areas. If that doesn't work, I'll try this. If that doesn't work, I'll try this. And so I'm sitting here thinking about Peter's statement about being done with sin, recognizing that that we are never done with the temptations to sin, ever. And they may change in form the longer we live for Jesus Christ. They may indeed change in form. But listen to me. This is what I think we should listen to about the radical optimism of the work of God in our lives and this idea of being done with sin. 
We are free to choose what we do with the temptations that come our way. We are not forced into making a choice that is disobedient to God. There is in every temptation a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. In every temptation, God provides an opportunity for us to choose his way. It's not easy. In fact, I would say to you this morning that one of the blessings about going to be forever with God in heaven is we will never be tempted ever again. That environment will thoroughly be done away with and we'll be in the righteousness of God forever. Until then, we are going to have to have an attitude of the sovereignty of Christ being my guide. This, this doneness doesn't really mean that I'm going to be done with this battle. It just means that I have this attitude that in all my ways, Lord, I want to acknowledge. I want to acknowledge your will. Could I turn, have you turn with me to Romans? Paul jumps into this discussion in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. And I think Paul is trying to win a battle here with the minds of Christians as to what's really going on. Here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who's doing it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good as a Christian, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And then he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Who has the ability to rescue me from the evil? Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has the ability and the power to rescue us from this war that is waging in our soul. Denying that there is a war, if it does exist, is problematic. The Apostle Paul powerfully describes this battle with sin in the Christian's heart. It feels like a war in our soul we advance some, we retreat. We win some battles, we lose some battles. But the keys to victory, if you'll hear me this morning, first of all, admit that the battle is still going on inside you. If it is going on, admit it. 
just recognize that admission is the beginning of victory. It's when we live in denial that something is going on inside of us. Who knows why we live that way? Maybe it's more comfortable or it's easier. Maybe, maybe our Nazarene tradition has brought us to a place where we don't like to say that we struggle with something. And I just say to you, admit what battles are going on inside of you. If there is a struggle going on in the area of obedience versus disobedience, let the Holy Spirit of God do something in your mind that changes the way you feel about that. May it make you sick to participate in it. May the Holy Spirit become so dominating in your life that you don't need not one person on this planet to say, oh, and by the way, that thing that you're doing, that you don't need anybody telling you because the Spirit of God is crying out to your heart, stop doing this. Surrender yourself to this so, sovereignty of God. But I, I tell you, the key to victory is admission that the battle is still going on. Two, to acknowledge how sick you are of the sin that still is inside. I take you back to the battle I was having with profanity. I don't know how many people I hurt with my language. I don't know how many people's opinions of my Christian walk was damaged by my language. And inside of me, I felt like, God, that's not that big a deal. <laughs> people understand. People just talk like this, Lord. You know that ball team I'm playing with? Every one of them talks like this. It's no big deal to for them to hear me, except, except, Lord, how oh, I guess it's a big deal. I'm a youth pastor. I'm, I'm glad to perfect, proclaim to you this morning that Tom doesn't swear. Thank you, Tom. Our youth pastor, he's, he's won that battle. He doesn't swear. Choose tobacco. I don't know what we're going to do with that. But. Oh, no, he doesn't do that either. Sorry, nothing like spreading images about our youth pastor. Uh, oh yeah, it was Isaac. That's that's who. That's was Isaac. Yeah, when he's younger. This, uh, you know, you can you can rationalize what's happening as not that big a deal, but you can never get away from the spirit's conviction that says it is a big deal to me. And somehow, somewhere inside of me, I, I began to recognize how big a deal it was to God and how injurious or harmful I was becoming to people. And so I said, Lord, I can't, I can't win this thing. You're going to have to win it for me. I recognize that I need some help. You're going to have to win it for me. And I began to pray. Lord, down deep in my soul, when my emotions get out of control, this is what comes out. Lord, would you take that word out of the emotional sting of my soul and give me something else in its place, something ludicrous or something crazy. Or some, some, and so I, the Lord began to take those words out of my life and replace them with some of the most ridiculous words you could ever think. So instead of a profane word, it would be, oh, chicken breath. Liver lips. And this litany of words just began to form in my life. And the teens thought it was great. They didn't know all the struggle that was going on in me, but here's this brand new lingo that's going around the teen group. And everybody all over the church was saying stuff like, like chicken chow and liver lips and goat breath and stuff like that. And it was all, 
It was all from this thing happening inside of me that couldn't tolerate any longer being trapped in something that the Lord said, I want you to be done with. Victory. Peter says having the attitude of Christ towards sin will result in us not living the rest of our earthly lives for the human evil desires. Rather, it will be a heartfelt motive to please God in all of our ways. Paul eloquently describes to the Philippians the last passage I want to read before we take communion this morning. We studied Philippians together not long ago. And we, we spent some time on this passage, so it's, it's not going to be totally unfamiliar. But Paul describes to the Philippians what it is like for us to be united with Christ, to be armed with Christ's attitude, as Peter says. When he writes in Philippians chapter 2, these eight verses, Paul says to the church at Philippi, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. There's the words Paul was talking about, arming ourselves with the attitude. Being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The sacrifice of Christ as an example to us is, your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, and the glory of God embodied the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And he humbled himself to the point of death. I am of the belief that in order to be second in my relationship, it's going to require my death. That the sovereignty of my own decision making is surrendered over obediently to God's. And part of what we do in the sharing of the Eucharist together is to identify with Him. So those that are going to distribute the elements, would you take your places and begin doing so as we think about the second place Assuming a new position before Christ. And may the blood of Jesus Christ, which is symbolic in these emblems, may it thoroughly work. And maybe today, Jesus Christ is speaking to some hearts about things that are that you're in war with, that you're battling over. Jesus Christ provides a victory for you today. And you could have an attitude today that says, I'm done with that. I'm done, done, done with that. And then in that declaration, you are also saying, and I am open, Lord Jesus, to anything you show me the rest of my life. So before we take these elements in just a moment, we're going to take a moment of just quiet reflection before the Lord. 
as we identify with him at his table and recognize his sacrifice. May his Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. Could we just, as we're passing out the elements, could we just be reflecting on what the Spirit says to the church? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he shared this meal, this last supper with his disciples as they celebrated Passover. He began to share with them some new things, some new teachings. He took some bread and he broke it. He gave thanks to the Father and he said to his disciples that night, he said, this is my body broken for you. So we take the bread today, Lord Jesus, realizing full well what you did for us and all that it entailed. And we bless your holy name for your willingness to surrender even to death on a cross. Take now this bread in remembrance that his body reigns supreme. We are the body of Christ because of his sacrifice. Later on in that meal, he held a cup of wine in the air and he said to his disciples, he said, this is my blood. He said, there's a new covenant that's going to reconcile God with man. It is the blood that I shed for the remission of sins. Basically, informing his disciples that he indeed is the Lamb of God. And sins are atoned for because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So he gave thanks. And they shared in the cup together. Realizing that it is the blood of the Son of God that reconciles us, forgives us of sin, cleanses us from sin. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that works in our life day in and day out. Oh God, bless us now as we share in this cup together. Take it and drink. It is in sheer gratefulness and thankfulness, Lord, that we share in this meal together, this communion. For all that you have done, Lord Jesus, we praise you. It is our distinct desire, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit guide and direct us from this moment forward. That you will show us, Lord, what victory looks like. And just how powerful and how strong and how able you are to destroy the sinful nature. And yet, Jesus, we acknowledge today that we who stand on you feel as if we are at times assaulted by this world. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that we would have the same attitude of Jesus Christ and that we would humble ourselves and that we would indeed Lord Jesus die so that you can live and reign in us and when we Lord get out of the flow of your spirit I pray that you would convict our hearts and that we would again fall before you and ask to be done. Done. We pray.
praise you and thank you, Jesus. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. The author of Hebrews said, keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ. For he is both the author and the perfecter of your faith. Let him have his way in your life. God bless you.